Kooky, welcome to the podcast, mate. Here we are. Oh, Mark, great to be here. We've got a lot to talk about today. There's lots going on, mate. Um, of yep. course, the, the whole uh, RBA rhythm's changed. Yes. Um, the next RBA meeting is what date? It's on the 19th of March, so 19th. next week from when we're recording. Yep. Uh, it's the first of that new cycle. If, if listeners can think back to our earlier discussion, the revamp of the RBA included a change in the timing of their meetings. It used to be the first Tuesday of every month. Now it's two weeks after the release of the quarterly GDP numbers and the quarterly inflation numbers. And just, well, roughly 10 days ago, the GDP numbers came out. So on the 19th of March is that meeting where we'll hear what they do, of course, and the governor gives a press conference so she can be grilled on, well, why did you keep rates steady or what are you talking about with unemployment, those sort of things. So that, and, uh, that, that's important, GDP. We're going to talk about GDP, but where does uh, unemployment fit into all this? Yeah, I, I think with inflation falling, we can talk about that a bit later too, I think the critical thing right now, and we heard the Treasurer Jim Chalmers talk about it recently. He's given a few press uh, conferences in the last week or two, and he has said that the focus of economic policy, now he's independent or the RBA is independent of him, we should emphasise, uh, but the focus of policy now is not just getting inflation under control. It's ensuring that unemployment doesn't get too high. And just as a bit of context, in the latter part of 2022, so roughly 18 months ago, the unemployment rate got to 3.4%. Right, quite incredible. 3.4 is incredibly low. Now, it's generally trended up as the economy has slowed. So the numbers that came out uh, on the unemployment rate uh, a few weeks ago was 4.1. So again, not a bad result, but in economics, it's the momentum of economic indicators that matters. So 3.4 to 3.7 to 3.9 to 4.1, and with job ads coming down still, job vacancies coming down, the unemployment rate's going to go up more in the next few months. Because you and I have talked about the Nairu, the uh, yeah. non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment. Correct. <laughs> which is what it stands for. But, uh, and, we, no, we've seen the modelling, and the modelling is yeah. four and a half, which is RBA modelling. They, they expected that the at rate at which inflation is no longer accelerating, that doesn't mean it's between 2 and 3%, but it's no longer <laughs> accelerating, um, is they model that um, unemployment should be at 4.5%. As you and I have said many occasions before, they'll overshoot it because no one's going to land at four and a half percent. No way. I mean, momentum makes usually makes you overshoot. They might, they might be able to reduce interest rates next meeting. Um, if they do that, maybe they won't overshoot. But do, where do you expect unemployment to end yeah. up? Because there's some people out there who are looking to change their job or what have you. Um, what do you reckon about that? I don't want to be too gloomy, but I'm getting more worried by the month, I suppose, as we get the monthly range of economic indicators coming through. I can't see a huge amount of reason to be optimistic about you know, the economy rebounding strongly and therefore job creation comes back and therefore the unemployment rate tops out at four and a half, which is the current RBA forecast. And as you said, it's Nehru for their, for their um, estimate, their modelling suggests. So uh, as I said, we've already gone up 0.7 percentage points from 3.4 to 4. Which actually is a lot. Which is actually quite a lot, If yes. you had a blood count... If yes. you went to the doctor and you yeah. got a blood count, it's a big and, move, and you've gone up by 0.7%, but they'd be saying, "Hang on, let's do some more investigation here." It's more than the US, who's had more rate hikes in Australia, by the way, and it's because our mortgage rates are incredibly linked to uh, variable rate or predominantly variable rates, as so, well as they're fixed, and they're fixed generally, generally speaking. So we've hit our economy harder, arguably, with the interest rate hiking cycle than say the US. So I think, and when you look at the correlation, the linkage, and between things like job advertisements because we do get good measures of those from Seek and Indeed, you know, the big job recruiting uh, companies, they've turned down somewhere between 20 and 25% from their peak. Demand for labour is falling. We've had the big increase in immigration. Now, we tend to focus on immigration in terms of housing demand, but it's also the supply of labour. Totally. These well, people, that's the whole point they of need, it. They need a job. But so, they also, that's part of the problem. And they, so that's they, why we brought them in. So... I reckon so that's a long way of saying I think four and a half would be a very optimistic forecast for the unemployment rate. The risk is that we get near a 5% simply because the economy's sluggish and we've got this increasing uh, pool of workers coming into the economy and demand from the private sector in particular is falling. So when we talk about 3.4% unemployment during or just post uh, COVID, 2022, um, but if you go back 
let's say pre-COVID or even go back a little bit beyond, beyond let's say go back five years, 5% unemployment is not that bad. <laughs> That's true. I remember pre-COVID that, yeah, 5%. Uh, four and a half percent was considered brilliant. It was great, yes. 5% was was okay. And if we got to four and a half, oops, we better be really careful here because that was considered to be uh, the sign of an overheating economy. Yeah, aggregate demand will increase as a result Correct. of such a low unemployment number. Correct. So what we've, and in fact, this is the really fascinating thing, whether it was the COVID pandemic that did it or maybe it's the catch-up of technology, something that, you know, we on a month-to-month well, basis, we don't cover. Mean. Productivity, artificial intelligence, machines doing stuff increasingly. You just got to look around how, you know, we all function in our work life, in our social life and at home. You know, machines, technology, you're like they're dominating everything, which is great, by the way, but you need less workers. And that's what businesses are doing. Just by the way, one of the big, one of the good parts of the Australian economy is business investment. That's the one thing that's still that's strong. Still going well. Still going well. We saw that in the, within the GDP numbers. They've got a business investment component. It's up 8% in real terms, which is a, which is a good result. What does that mean? Firms are um, getting machinery and equipment and IT spend. They're spending up a lot of money because they can see, well, they have to, to be competitive. Now, that also has the double-edged sword of reducing demand for labour. Like if I'm a business person and I can buy uh, a truck and something to do that used to be <laughs> done by no, five, if I can write my ads, if I don't need an advertising agency anymore, because I can uh, write my ads using uh, ChatGPT. GPT. Correct, and that's so that it, correct. So machinery and that that artificial intelligence means that demand for labour is going to be a little bit less anyway. And I think that might be causing, well, first of all, the the, the unemployment rate to increase, but that structural lowering in unemployment is because it's dragged workers away from the labour intensive parts of the economy. So where there's a shortage of labour still is nursing, aged care, healthcare, education, there's a shortage of teachers and all this sort of stuff because people are going to uni and TAFE and whatever and studying these like really sexy courses because I want to be a, an IT guru and all this other stuff. I, I, pardon me, I don't understand. Computer exactly scientists. Computer science. Thank you, Mark. I can't Data remember. scientists. Rather than becoming a teacher or whatever. Yeah, well, yeah and that is generally a trend. And so what that means is that uh, that's where the unemployment rate is probably, the NARA is probably lower than the RBA was assuming a few years ago. So let's say we do overshoot. It's not that bad, but it's not a good thing. We prefer no one to lose their job, you and I, Correct. definitely. And oh, gov- yes. government, no one wants to have anyone lose a job. But Correct. unfortunately these things do happen in those is interest rate environments because the interest rate environment is actually designed to have that cause yes. and effect. So if I... I, you know, I did raise unemployment as one of the important factors because we, you know, we're going to look at your board in a moment. But unemployment is, it, it to you and I, is an important thing. Also, wage pressure as a result of low unemployment. You know, wage pressures are important because you know the higher, the more wages go up, the more employers or um, proprietors feel the need to maintain the margin, therefore put their prices up. Correct. Which is, uh, you know, another yeah. cause of inflation sometimes, depending on what the demand is. But let's just talk about GDP because this is the meeting you and I are having post-GDP numbers coming out, right, the quarterly GDP. And uh, just quickly, GDP is, you know, we use the expenditure method in this country here and we talk GDP basically is a formula of um, household consumption plus business investment, which is made up of mining and non-mining plus government expenditure plus the difference between exports and imports. You got it. That's it. That's the output of goods and services in the economy. Correct. And... We actually don't know what the real number is. It's a, They take a sample and they extrapolate from that and they come up with a number in the trillions. Yes. Right? Australia's economy now is almost $3 trillion. $3 trillion. So, and the biggest, we, you and I always say, every time we meet, the biggest component or contributor to that $3 trillion is household consumption. And we're going to talk Correct. about it in a second. Um, of course, infl- um, interest rates are directed straight at those people, <laughs> right at those people, right at that community. Right. So, yep. so. <laughs> In that formula, what's looking good and what's looking no, not so good? Yeah. the uh, I'll start on the good. As we mentioned, business investment's doing well. 
the, despite the rate hikes. So we've got CapEx, business investment, as I said, in machinery, equipment, and even buildings. Could you break like, it up into mining and non-mining? Because there's, uh, there's two so, different yes, parts. A, indeed, a very important point to make. Mining's pretty flat. Hmm. You know, mining had its big investment boom, what, uh, 8, 10, 12 years during, ago. During the GFC. Massive investment boom, and that's what we are now exporting. So all that production of iron ore and coal and LNG. Ports, the north, roads. The north was, oh, all that stuff. The We're machine. now using it for product, productivity. So the investment's done. Now the diggers are digging out the stuff, putting it on a conveyor belt and putting it in the ship. That's yep. done. Terrific. But it's still, it's still okay. Because we're looking for increases. Yes. We're not looking for what is the number. We're no, looking at what's the increase. It's got to grow. Yep. And that's where the non-mining sector is doing very well. Really interesting. We've got a shortage of hotels. So hotel construction's going up. The way that we have our retailing, and even though retail sector is very weak, if you've got the big – uh, the big retailers coming into Australia, which they are, and even the big local ones expanding their business. They're building warehouses, warehouses, specific warehouses with barcodes so that when I say, oh, look, I need to, oh, I don't know, I need to sort of buy something, uh, click, 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 there's a there's a machine <laughs> with a barcode that says, Stephen Kokoulis, here's your parcel to be delivered to your address and in this warehouse that has to be built. Logistics. The logistics is huge and they have to buy a truck to drive it to my house. And, and they have to, to build a factory. They have to build a conveyor Correct. belt. So, any, so even though we are still buying goods, of course we are. We're buying stuff every day. But the way we are buying is less walking into a bricks and mortar shop. So that's where the capex in buildings is also strong. Now, we probably don't need any more CBD offices because that work from home issue is simmering, but there's an oversupply of offices. That's fine. But things like, yes, the warehouses, the hotels, ah, Construction related to the university sector, you know, so uh, um, on campus accommodation, things like that are, are huge. So that's the good part of the economy. So, what is that? What has business investment increased by? It's increased by 8% in the last Which year. Which went non mining or mine or both? Uh, well, non, no, non mining's actually gone up by about 12%. Right. Mining sort of uh, about 2%. So, the average of the two cause is, eight. is a bit big. The average, yeah. The one number's a bit bigger, bigger than the other one, bit, but yeah. the average is about eight. Yeah, so, so, so that's good. That's actually put a floor. And by the way, without that, we'd almost have zero GDP. So growth. I was going to ask you the business investment, which is business investment, mining and non mining. What is if we say household consumption sort of contributes somewhere between sixty and seventy percent of the total formula? What does uh, BI? Business investment between fifteen and twenty percent. So let's say it's, okay, fifteen percent, twenty percent. It's about. It's important uh, uh, though. Oh, it's very important, yes. And it's important not just for today's GDP number, but for your productivity. Yeah, so yeah. I get that. Yeah. So if we just, we won't do household consumption for a second, yeah. we just yeah. move along to government expenditure. Government expenditure. So that includes uh, state, federal, everything. Everything. It includes building for the Olympic Games in Brisbane in 2032, the fact that the Victorian government sort of canned the Commonwealth Games, those sort of things too. And there's actually been a lot of um, infrastructure which is done by both Commonwealth and state governments postponed because they're running into budget problems and they're running into cost problems because they couldn't find labour and and the materials to build these things. Now, that said, we've actually got uh, a flattish period. It's, there's a small positive from government in spending. In terms of increase. But not yes, in a small Increase, yep. but it's very small. During the GFC, it was massive, of course, because we had the massive fiscal stimulus. Yep. There was a bit of a pullback in late 22, early 23, and now we've normalised, but it's still small positive. Right. So, And we are employing more, we are actually employing more police, which is a state government thing, teachers they're trying to employ, aged care is another one, and they're, on the, they're part of public consumption. When you pay a, a police officer, for example, we need more police. That's part of the state government expenditure. So it's a small positive, not big, but uh, certainly, you know, not not dragging on the economy in any way. So let's look at exports minus imports. Yeah. So and you know, what they're basically saying is the value of what we export minus the value of what we import. Yep. We're a big exporter of resources, as we all know, and that actually got us through the uh, GFC in a positive yeah, GDP number. Certainly, did. Uh, whereas the rest of the world was underwater. Where you know we. Um, play way above our weight when it comes to exports. Um, so, the, and one of the export sectors for us, of course, is education. Um, it's resources as well. Yep. There are a number of other things we export, but they're probably one and two or three, I think. Uh, yeah, oh, they're the dominant ones. So, yeah, iron, dominant. coal, natural gas, 
education yep. would be oh, three quarters of the stuff yep. that we have. Yeah, correct. Yep. And um, and of course, probably eighty percent of the resources get go to between China, Korea, and Japan. Correct. So that's where we correct. export most of our stuff to. So correct. Their Absolutely. economies are important relative to our export number. You bet they are. And the <laughs> yes. price of the commodity being exported is important. So where is yeah. exports minus imports? What did that look like in the last reading? Yeah, it's choppy. Last reading was positive again. It, so that was another thing that was good. The quarter before that was a bit weak. Quarter on quarter, it can be a bit volatile. Yeah, you know, if the ship leaves on the, you know, 30th of June rather than the 1st of July, that's, you know, that could be a couple of hundred million bucks in terms of export receipts. So it's, it can be volatile, but the broad trend is pretty it's reasonable but slowing down. You mentioned uh, our major export markets, China, uh, Japan and Korea. South Korea. China's slowing down. And we're seeing that in the price of iron ore coming off. You know, as we're sitting here, it's come off about 25, 30 US dollars a tonne over the last uh, six to eight weeks. As the Chinese economy has slowed down, demand for iron ore has slowed down. And what people need to understand, like it's probably worth recognising now, Steve, is that um, we're a great exporter of protein because people are moving from the rural areas into the cities and they Correct. don't have the protein they normally have living in the country. So, you know, that's you know, cattle and beef and those sort of fish and whatever else we export. Yeah. We're a great yeah. exporter of steel or iron ore, which you need to oh, build cities massive, with. Yeah. And we're a great exporter of uh, heating or thermal yeah. coal because that's what you need to uh, melt the iron ore to <laughs> make the steel. And the reason they need steel is because yeah. they're building cities, trying to build cities. Correct. But that's all slowed down. That slowed down dramatically. And, in fact, the interesting thing about, or, in fact, both China and Japan, which is still our second largest, ex second largest export market, uh, is that their population growth is now starting to fall. So you think about, well, do we need to build, you know, another million new houses in Japan and China? Well, probably not. You've probably got to replace old ones. And there is still some infrastructure spend going on on railways and these sorts of things. So that's... That's still growing, but the rate of increase is coming down sharply. So, again, it's not one of these things that's going to impact the economy tomorrow or even next year or the year after, but it's a trend. If I was the government or advising the government, you know, whatever their colour of their politics, I'd be saying, look, great while we're exporting all this stuff to China and Japan, but have a little bit of an eye out on what is happening because it could come and bite us pretty quickly if they slow down more. And, and we're not the only producer of iron ore in the world, by the way. Really? <laughs> There's a lot of places South in South America, countries. massive producers. And you say, well, you know, if they can do it cheaper than we can, we've got a we've got an issue. I'm not saying we're there yet, but I'd just be a little bit cautious. So exports minus so import they're had brought, they're, positive. They're a little bit positive in the last but uh, positive quarter, and, yeah. and growth. Yeah, and positive. added to growth. Yes, they added a little bit to growth. Right. The, now the two areas of weakness well, was one was um, in investment. I should actually have to bro broken that down from not just. Uh, mining and non-mining investment, there's also dwelling investment, yeah. which is when builders build a house or an apartment block or whatever. That's way off. And Correct. That that put a big hole in GDP. So that weak GDP number that we saw was driven a lot by dwelling investment coming down. So property developers aren't building. They're going bust. We hear it almost every week in the in the press. There's uh, another one, another medium-sized, small-sized um, builder it's going bust. And, and now let's look at household consumption. That's the weak. Big, big, weak, weak as can be. It, it was basically dead flat in the quarter, so it made no contribution to GDP. So our GDP of 0.2%, uh, household consumption was zero, nothing. And that's with population growing by half a percent in the quarter for that big immigration. That's a worry. Yes. Uh, from a GDP reading. From, from, it, it is. It is a worry. And you know, and it's one of those things that the RBA, be careful what you wish for. Yes, they, as you discussed and we've discussed many times, they wanted the economy to slow down. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, but they've achieved it. And this is the really interesting debate for the next couple of RBA meetings. They've achieved the slowdown. It's happened. And don't forget that those GDP numbers were for the December quarter, which is October, November, December, Divided by July, August, and September, here we are in the middle of March. Yeah, you know, and it's so, worse. And, and it's going to be yes, it's looking pretty crook, which could the, could put us into a negative. So unless you start doing something on policy very soon, because as we know, it takes a while. You adjust interest rates today, just for example, it doesn't impact the economy tomorrow. It takes you know a while for it to work its way through the economy. So you, you, which is why I think we're going to get worse before, before we get, we get better. better. So the GDP number was 0.2% for the quarter, 1.5 for the year, 1.5. And if we adjust it for Population. Canada? 
per capita, capita. we were minus 0.3, three consecutive quarters of negative GDP per person. Which means a recession on a per capita basis. Yes, which means, which means and that's how we, we as individuals feel it. You know, um, if per capita GDP is rising, that's an increase in living standards, yep. an increase in well-being, you know, and that's what we normally have. Yeah, good. Uh, it's a worthy thing, but when you even if top line, we'll call it top line GDP is growing, but it's only growing because there's more people here. Yeah, going about their business, they buy groceries, they pay rent, they you know do whatever they do, and it feeds into GDP being at point two. Take out all those extra people, it's minus point three. For me, I get quite quite nervous about point two. It really worries the hell out of me. Yeah. All right, mate. Let's look at your. Board. Ah, the board. What's going on there? So, monetary uh, policy checklist. Let, let's yep. just go through this, Mark, and yep. you know, fire away with some good GDP. questions. I'm putting that into neutral to easing. We're not quite in easing because it's still growing, but the numbers are coming down and coming down quite a lot. So, yep. if we get another weak quarter in the March quarter, which is probable, probable I'm, meaning greater than a fifty percent chance. Oh yeah, yeah, that yep. we get something and on a, and by a weak GDP result. Uh, that's 0.5 quarter on quarter. You know, we need to grow the economy at half a percent at least per quarter. You know what's interesting okay about economy. this? They, 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 when they build the budget, yeah. for the, they build the, they're working yeah. on usually working on a 3% assumption. Yeah, a uh, high two. I think they've just scaled it back to like 2.75 or something. Yeah, like, well, so they like just call do, it 3%. Yeah, what does yeah. that do for the budget? It puts a hole in it. <laughs> totally. <laughs> it put, indeed. And the, well, the budget's in the uh, middle of May. Yep. Two months roughly from now. Uh, we'll see what the budget numbers hold. I think mean, Jim Chalmers has got a interesting challenge to try to balance his budget again. Because the economy is weaker, if it's weaker, you get less employment, you get less um, income less tax. tax and all the rest of it. So that's the risk there. Inflation I'm putting in neutral. We had the monthly inflation number come out uh, recently, 3.4. Not quite in the target range, but remember, Mark, and I remember we were – Oh, we were spitting chips when it got to 8.4% on that monthly indicator at the end of 2022, 8.4 to 3.4. Wow, five percentage points in 13 months but has Steve, come down. I remember that you and I were um, <laughs> quite strong a little while ago saying that the forward-looking inflation or instead yep. of the backward-looking inflation, yep. which is normally how they operate, was tracking around 3%. Where if, I, yeah. if we look forward, oh, based indeed. on the quarter, yes, based on the, and in fact, it, indeed, if you look at the quarterly, the December quarter again, in, inflation number, that was zero point six. Multiply it by four, that's two and a half. Yeah, correct. So you could almost put that into easing. Oh, I want to. Oh, I'll be a bit conservative. I want to see one or two more numbers on inflation before I push that into the easing column. But my, my just gov- in case. But, mate, but I my, think we. I think we're almost there. I yeah, think yeah, my yeah, government yeah, is we're there yeah. now. If yep. I, if we could just say what is inflation like right now, I would say yeah, we're, yeah. we're in we're somewhere between between two and three. I think we are right now too. When we get those numbers for the March quarter at the end of April, so yep. to be sort of throwing all these yep. dates out there, it'll it'll almost certainly confirm that we're within the target range. Right, eh? labor right market, labor market. I'm going to put that towards easing. You know, as we said, three point four to four point one on the unemployment rate. Uh, the job ads down. You don't want it to go high. You know, as you said, we've. Do you know? And just I'll just take a step back. Do you know that three point four to four point one percent unemployment rate? That's about one hundred and twenty five thousand people. Mm. Not just a oh, an economist talking unemployment rate. Think about the MCG on Grand Final Day with one hundred thousand people in it. It's that number plus another twenty five thousand who have who don't have a job today, who would have had a job if the unemployment rate stayed at three point four percent. As of thirty one December. Uh, that's uh, January data. As, as of January. Uh, January, yep. As yep. of 31, 31 January. 31 January, yes. So so it's a big human number, if you know what I mean. So here we are, a converse, oh, 3.4, 4.1. It's a bloody 125,000 And there may well be another uh, oh. 0.5 sitting in there. If we get to 4.5, which is the RBA's forecast, you're getting close to 200,000 yeah. people wow. unemployed from where we, wow. where, where we were. That's what about, what, so what, what, what effect is that having on wage pressures? Ah, this is the interesting thing. The wages numbers, I'm putting in neutral because the numbers that we have, and think back, and I don't want to labour this point, pardon the pun, um, the Fair Work Commission bumped up the minimum wage on the 1st of July, so what was that, eight months ago, uh, and the government, the federal government, ramped up pay for people in uh, aged care, nursing care. That had a big impact on the way wages are measured, as it should. And and by the way, I think I agree with uh, – I, no, I do agree Mate, with what they fair did. policy. Because wages have been very weak for a long time ago. But what it means is that wages growth is currently at 4.2, but even that 
masks, the fact that in December it was only 0.9%, 0.9 times 4 to annualise, it's about 3.5% to 3.75%. Three absolutely in the Goldilocks range of wages. Not too hot, not too cold, just right. So yeah, there's nothing wrong with wages growth at 35 to 4%. We're basically there now. But I wouldn't cut just on the wages scenario. International economy, uh, we've got inflation falling. European, European central banks are going to be cutting rates pretty soon, probably be the, one of the first cabs off the rank. Bank of Canada is not far behind. Bank of England is not far behind. The Fed, there's a hot, hot debate. So we got the, the next round of um, uh, inflation data there is going to determine when they cut, not if, when. So the international economy, look, I'll put that in easing. The next move in interest rates in all the big econ- economies is down. No one's going to hike. We're going to be part of that. House prices, I'll put that in neutral. They're still going up, but not rapidly. The rental market's as tight as a drum, as we've discussed many times. Less than 1% on it's average. Ex- it's extraordinary. Across right? the country. It's, it's, rents are going up at 10% plus, you know, really? depending on which city you're in. But um, so you, you sort of don't, that's the rate hiking cycle for housing, because if you hike too much, you'll stop developers building property, and we need more properties. Um, but you need to sort of cool demand. I think that's driven more by population than interest rates. But you put it in the neutral case. Retail sales, we've discussed, shocking. Weak as water. Uh, we consumers are not silly. We're hunkering down. Cost of living, uh, rate hikes past uh, are impacting our spending. So retail sales are very weak. Putting a hole, as we discussed, in household consumption, a really big part of um, uh, GDP, of the economy. Consumer sentiment the same. Just earlier, we had the, um, I think it was the ANZ and Westpac consumer sentiment numbers. They're bouncing around pretty ordinary levels. You'd cut interest rates. They're consistent with the global financial crisis. The early recessions that we had in the 1990s, consumers are feeling glum. They're, they're great, very good indicators. And they're a great indicator, yes. And as I said, consumers are smart. They know what's happening to their hip pocket. They know what's happening to their bank balance. Every every repayment they make, every rent payment they make, every wage that goes in, oh, geez, the things stuff. They go to the supermarket, oh, my God, it's gone up a lot. Well, just, add on, just on that, in yeah. terms of sentiment, when does the next um, savings National savings number come out because you know if you recall, uh, um, our, yeah, our Reserve yeah. Bank governor was talking for a long time, and it was coming out in the uh, financial stability report. But she talked about yes. Australians having saved two hundred fifty billion. Correct. Well, we've you know we've we've got two hundred fifty billion dollars, which gave her great pause uh, for the rate rises for a buffer. Yeah. Uh, when does that come next month? I think we may have seen that in those national accounts. I saw well, it normally would have come in February. Um, yeah, numbers. we did, and I think the numbers come down because the household saving rates come down a bit. I'll have to check. I'll get back to you for our next conversation. Because I that's, think that's an important. Why don't we spend a few minutes talking about that next time? Yeah, because no, that's I, a savings are a yeah they are a buffer. Yeah, you know they can keep your head above water like rate hikes and you know low wages growth. Oh geez, you know, oh phew, I've got savings so I can you know keep my head above water until interest rates are cut. But, we, but we should talk about the next one. Should for sure. Building approvals weak as water. We just discussed. We need more houses being built. They're not being built. Property developers going bust. I put that in the easing side. Business investment. We spent a bit of time on that today. Looking fine. Hey. Look, you don't hike rates because business investment's strong. They don't need. They don't need an interest rate cut to help them along. Business confidence. We just saw the NAB survey. Pretty good too. Businesses are way more optimistic than we consumers. They're. Yeah, and maybe they're linked to the export sector, the business side. So if you're an iron ore or a coal exporter, you're doing fine. But the question then becomes um, who does the ABS interview in relation to business investment? Because oh, and it depends who answers. They, they interview many thousands of businesses and they weight them according to the size. So a BHP or even a Commonwealth Bank, because they have a lot of CapEx on IT and uh, you know, computers and all that sort of stuff. Uh, versus a little, well, not quite a corner store, but just say a store with you know ten million turnover or something like that. They do weight it, of course, according to the size of the business. But it's yeah, but the business side of the economy, and they also measure it through imports because most of the machinery is imported. So you're buying a, oh, I don't know, a computer or a lathe or a truck. You know, we import that stuff. So they sort of can cross check it against the imports. And actually, the imports of machinery has been pretty robust. So that says that business investment's doing well too. Commodities, neutral. I said iron ore's come off a bit or quite a bit, but it's still 110 odd. Interest rates don't really influence it. No, they influence the Aussie dollar, but it's at 66 cents. So it's very competitive. Yeah. Probably don't need to worry about it. Stock markets booming. I'm going to leave that at neutral, whatever. 
Uh, and current interest rates, I'm going to put that in easing because they're currently 4.35%. Even the RBA say that's restrictive. So the chances of another rate hike in Australia, never say never, but it's got to be 1%. For this year? Yeah, for yeah. this year, then they're not going to hike. Money markets, what are they saying? Money markets have got the first rate cut priced in during uh, the September quarter, so between July, August and September. Another one in the latter part of this year and one more in the first half of 2025. And so what are the big guys saying? What are the big banks? CBI, CBA are the most um, bullish. They've got uh, 150 points of rate cuts in their forecast. Oh, through to 2025. I'll, I'll go 18 months out. Um, so they've got the middle of uh, next year, 2.85 for the cash rate. Wow. Westpac had, well, I think Lucy Ellis, who's the new chief what? economist, took over from good old Bill Evans and good old Lucy. She's sort of a s- smart woman doing a great job. Uh, I still think they've got the seven rate cuts also wow. over the next two years. Uh, ANZ, a bit, they're a bit more what do we call hawkish. They say the rate cuts will tend to be a little bit later and a little bit less. So I think they've got 100 points of cuts priced in. NAB, about 100 points of cuts priced in. So they're four rate reductions. So we've got four 25-point rate cuts between the middle of this year, without picking the exact date, through to the middle-ish part of next year, without picking the exact date. So, and again, that's an important thing to remember. The rate-cutting cycle that you will hear more and more about as this economic data remains soft and weak and soggy, uh, we're not going back to where we were uh, in the pandemic, nor do we want to, <laughs> frankly. More or less, All yeah. we are talking about is 100, maybe 150 basis points, so six 25-point rate cuts at most, because the economy just doesn't need more than that. It'll just be more giving a bit of relief to the household sector that's been under the pump for so long, improving their cash flow, whew, getting the economy back on an even keel, and then we'll just let the economy grow. So so, so what we're saying is the off the back of your board and definitely no rate rise. No, Nothing or, in the time or, or rate reduction. Not, Not yet. quite. Not yet. Um, the money markets and, and or our, our banks who, you know, who've got pretty, pretty bloody good data, relatively yes. speaking, um, in relation to their customers at least, they're all s- suggesting somewhere between between four rate cuts and six rate cuts depending on which bank we're looking at, Yep. Um, starting sometime this year, l- latter part of this year and going through to 2025. Um, and that that must that will be for those people who manage to hang in there um, and hopefully that's everyone. Um, that's yep. sort of pretty good news, I think. It is. So, and the again, the time you're the first one is really hard to say. You know, we, it, we, we've got so much more important data coming through in the next couple of months, which we'll discuss at our next couple of meetings. But if... The next inflation number is, say, 0.6 again. We get the next couple of monthly readings on the unemployment rate, 4.2, 4.3, 4.5. That's when it'll be game on. That's when it's not just talk about rate cuts. That's when the RBA will have to deliver. Because, you know, it, despite our uh, other people's criticisms of the RBA, they don't want 5% unemployment. No. They don't want unemployment to go to below 2%. They don't want the economy to be in recession. Now, they can be very stubborn and dare I say it, a bit pig-headed in the way they approach interest rates from time to time. But if the writing's on the wall, if it's bloody obvious, look at the inflation numbers, look at the unemployment numbers, look at the GDP numbers, and it says, look, things are pretty crook, they'll go. So that's really quite interesting, um, when, when, the way you just put it. Uh, why doesn't the RBA get on the front foot? Why is it always uh, about historical positions? Uh, Mark, I remember us discussing these things. When was Glenn Stevens governor? Early 2000s. Mm. I think that's when we started talking about these things in a great, a lot of, great amount of detail. Glenn Stevens as governor, and I don't mean, oh, okay, you know, I'm an old bloke. I remember all that stuff from <laughs> a long hundred years ago. He's, one of the things that he liked to talk about was being preemptive. Yeah, the preemptive. Now he didn't always get it right, and he not. But the beauty about Glenn Stevens, I've got the highest admiration. I think he's been our best RBA governor so do I. that I can remember, <laughs> and I can remember quite a few of them. Look at my grey hair. He's been he was excellent, but he was preemptive. So if, if he was sitting here, and this was his checklist, you know, we're the RBA board, just pretend. I reckon he'd be cutting soon, just it, you know, on the on the premise that if I don't cut we could have a real problem and just say deliver two cuts, just say uh, in the March meeting and the May meeting and see how it goes. Is that going to rekindle inflation? No. Which is one, one is cut. Is it insurance against a hard landing? Well, it might just help sentiment. 
that might just get a little bit more momentum in the economy, stop that unemployment rate getting towards 5%. So Captain, if he got it wrong, well, he'd hike at the end of the year. You know, he didn't mind- Or pause. Or pause, yes. He didn't mind using interest rates according to the momentum. And in fact, this is where this checklist was born, to be to be honest, you know, all that 20, 30, oh, I can't remember now, 25 years ago. Um, that's where it was born because he would, he and his board of the day, back in the day, were looking at things like this and they'd say, look, we've got this. Let's just have a look at this. Okay, building approvals and unemployment and inflation and GDP. And they'd have this conversation more or less as we've just had with a few more board members. Um, and they'd say, look, what if, if we cut 25 tomorrow, what is the risk that all of a sudden we get whoosh and the inflation problem? Almost none. What is the risk that we just keep the economy from you know, dropping into that hard landing? Well, it, it, it's an insurance policy against a hard landing. So the RBA has not been preemptive at all in the last Why? 10 years. I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I think it's the personalities. Yeah, it must be. Uh, and I and I again I don't want to speak ill of the personalities, you know, Dr. Lowe and um, and others, but they were very, very wedded to their economic models. Their models were way more important than uh, the feedback they were getting from business. And in fact, the interesting thing that what in the last year of Dr. Lowe as governor, and don't forget he only ended his term in September last year, was and they report this in their quarterly statement now, is is a whole slab, like a you know, five pages or whatever it is, on business liaison. It's trivial for GDP to be 2% or 1%, whatever. But if the business sector is telling you, the RBA, things are crook, you know, I'm not hiring anymore, listen to that. Take that into account. And, in fact, if we go back, uh, what is it, four years ago and no rate hikes till 2024, that famous comment when mm -hmm. Dr Lowe said when cash rate was 0.1, we're not going to hike till 2024, business was screaming at him that inflation was picking up. I can't find labour. Wages are picking up. You know, not that they've got a hike, but, you know, he should have at least softened his language and maybe gone a little bit early. Then we probably wouldn't have had the magnitude of the rate cuts that we've had. And one final thing that I've noticed under the new regime um, is that there's a lot more emphasis on unemployment from the ABA. They, they never really used to talk about unemployment as being a big factor in terms of their um, um, call it mandate. Um, and more recently, and in fact, in fact, you know, the Treasurer, I think, is pushing this a little bit, that I want you, the Reserve Bank, to be more interested in unemployment or employment, yeah. whichever way you want to look at it. Um, given unemployment could be a, doesn't look great in terms of its momentum at the moment, do you think that uh, maybe they're going to, given they're not, they're not being preemptive, but they might become preemptive if they start to look at their their new thesis around unemployment? What do you think? Yeah, I, I think that's absolutely critical to the to the way that we in the markets and you and me are talking about interest rate settings. Unemployed with the new re re revised charter, I suppose we call it that, yep. the RBA, the new uh, methodology. Because they didn't talk about unemployment before. No, only in passing. Well, it was only, always, only, always only about growth indicator. and prosperity for and inflation Australia, target and inflation, yes. Now, and this, is, and this is the rhetoric that uh, I mentioned earlier, that Jim Chalmers as treasurer, now I know he's not the RBA, but yeah, he's appointed the RBA, um, says that we're moving our emphasis away from inflation management towards managing the rise in the unemployment rate. Yep. He and the RBA, to be fair, as we're saying, don't want unemployment rate to go up. So if 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 we get those and we get monthly data on the unemployment rate. So that's where that's one high frequency economic data release. So every month we get that number. And that's why last month the markets went a bit crazy when we went from 3.9 to 4.1 in one month. If next month we go to 4.3 or you know in the next couple of months we get to four and a half percent, the RBA will be out there and saying, look, we, we we've got to trim rates. Wait, if I'll, we don't, it's going to go to five or more. Which I would, would have thought they're going to be much more um Let's call it preemptive, yeah, uh, yeah. not because of liaison yeah. discussions or et cetera, but, yeah. I, I, but just because I think I think the unemployment number is going to be is going to be, have far more weight in their early decision making than it's ever had in the past. It, co correct, and the fact that it's going up mean tells me which direction interest rates are going, which is down. We are only debating when and how many rate cuts there'll be in this cycle. Well, I reckon I'll put up a fearless prediction. Um, if the unemployment gets over the four and a half, past their uh, modelled unemployment number, the NIRU, I reckon they'll be looking at within two or three months to reducing the rates. 
from that point. So I would say to anybody, just keep looking at that employee. If you when if you see it at four and a half or going past four and a half, you can bet very soon that they'll put raise down. That's what I think. I think I think that's fair, and I think assuming uh, everything else is yeah you know, no no I, I think that no no I think that's absolutely spot on because if that happens it means that inflation's coming down. Yep. You don't get unemployment jumping with inflation going Correct. up very rarely. We're not going to get it this time around. It does mean that a few people will lose their jobs, as we just discussed, which is very bad. But if you're hanging in there, if you're hanging in there, uh, that interest rate relief will be will be felt not, uh, and a relief. It'll just be. It doesn't. And again, this is the thing. Because rates have been hiked so much, the first couple of rate cuts, just say we get two before the end of the year, just for argument's sake, that 50 basis points will free up a bit of your cash flow and you'll breathe a sigh of relief. doesn't mean you're going to do cartwheels down the street, oh, I've got all this money, I'm going to go and go crazy, but it just gives a bit of relief to the, the, pressure to the people with a chunky mortgage. Fugi, good to see you again, mate. See you next month. Thanks, Mark. See you soon. 